Welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. Welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. Welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. I'm your host, Two Black. Um, we're back here at the beginning of the year uh, with my co host Terrell and Cam. Ryan is on sabbatical, but he'll be back for the next episode. Um, how y'all doing? Living. <laughs> I'm alive. That's literally what I was that's, that's, I'm alive. <laughs> I'm still black. <laughs> we always sound like we about to die on this show. Like, I got the, oh, you know, I'm, I'm barely breathing. But you know, I'm here. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm doing okay, I guess. But it's January. I, I'm i finally with all of my nieces and nephews. And there's a lot of them. We got a new addition to the family. And the baby just chose to scream the entirety of the night. So I am running off of love right now and <laughs> I just, I have no energy. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm literally I'm hanging here. on by the hairs of my chinny chin chin. Like and there's not that many of them. He's hanging on. By yeah, the exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like bro, the debt factory is is working me right now and I'm just not enjoying it. And also I'm studying a lot, trying to get my IT certifications out the way. So I can switch careers. <laughs> I hear that. Yeah, yeah I'm, I've had better times myself. All right. So thank you all for watching the Black Miss podcast. We appreciate your support and we appreciate our Patreon support. Um, so we're going to shout out a few names on here. I have SZ Lion. Shout out to you. Gary Lee. Shout out to you. Uh, Akasil Barnes. Shout out to you. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Shout out to obscure noun h shout out to you brother i can't pronounce it but shout out to you <laughs> shout out to kevin j prather shout out to diana throng uh shout out to jess k shout out to uh prudent penguin shout out to uh what is it doubting yeah, Doubting Thomas. I like that name. Shout out to Bridget Quinn. We appreciate all of our Patreon supporters very much. Yeah, so um, today's myth is... Um, sad. Hmm? I said today's myth is sad. Oh, I thought you said fad. I was like, what? what? Uh, <laughs> I thought I was like, it's a fad. No. Um, now, today's myth is uh, Patrice Lumumba was overthrown because he was a communist. And we put this in air quotes, um, you know. Um, to give a little context, he was assassinated on January 17th, which when this drops will be January 17th. So if you're listening to this now, in the moment that you're listening, it's, it's the day. So that was 1961, 62 years ago, I believe. So um you know, it's the, it's the anniversary of the assassination. And this is a time where often people are going to be talking about Dr. King, which we have no beef with. But um, I think that sometimes it overshadows because Dr. King's day, Dr. King Day this month is on the 16th. Um, and the very next day is the day that um, Patrice Lumumba was assassinated. For those who don't know, Patrice Lumumba was the prime minister of the Congo, uh, the newly independent Congo. Um, that was colonized by the Belgium by Belgium or the Belgians, um, and he was the you know pretty much the leader of the nationalist movement for independence there, and the, the United States CIA in concert with the Belgian government, and there was even some involvement from the British um, on the low. The MI6 um, all worked together to have him assassinated, as well as many um, Uncle Tom Congolese, which we'll get to. Uh, so this is going to take a little more time. To, we really want to do this justice. So uh, we're going to be doing usually our one, our part one and two is one. We'll have a guest. We might even have three parts. Still want to talk to a guest. But just for us to get through everything, it's um, going to be it's going to be um, two parts. So today we're going to cover the um, 
the kind of the oh, the beginning of when the Bel- the Belgium um, colonized um, the Congo up until independence, and then after that, we'll deal with what happens once the Congo got independence. What happened to Lumumba? What led to his assassination? Um, a lot of the CIA um, machinations that went into it since we're in the United States and uh, going to be pulling primarily from a book called White Malice, um, the, the how the CIA recolonized Africa um, by Susan Williams and a few other books on that just have some bio, biography on Patrice Lumumba. So. So there's that. But I'm just curious because there's a lot of research for this. We're not even done, honestly. <laughs> so. But I mean, the book we're using is, a, I think, I don't know how many pages it is. I think it's like 845 pages, a very long book, very thorough book. You know, some books are long, they're not very thorough. This is a very thorough book. Um, So just curious how some of y'all are responding to the research, which I thought of the myth, et cetera. I think it's incredibly difficult to continue to deny the ways in which the United States is just destroying the world intentionally. Um, And so I think like every time we look at another book, another article, another uncovered um, document that is finally released, even with all of the redacted information in it, it is just continuously clear that the United States is a disgusting imperialist nation hell bent on milking Africa dry. And it pisses me off every second. Yeah, I'm right there with Cam. Like... Bro, America's tra- America is toxic if we're going to use these, you know, I don't, I don't know what these buzzwords or whatever buzzwords today. America is toxic. Capitalism is the detriment of everyone inside yeah. America, outside of America, other countries. Like, it's, uh, I, 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 only way I can think of it is like, America acts as if you if you ain't riding with us, if you don't get down, then you lay down. Yeah. And that, that's the best way. I, that's the best way I can, you know, put it for my real niggas out there. If you don't get down, you yeah. lay down. And yeah. for America to be so star spangled fucking great, we done made a lot of motherfuckers lay down for our bullshit. Yeah. It, it's also just like it is. It just makes it more clear that um, we live in a really, really censored nation as well. Because anybody who would pick up a book or look online or like really dive into international news and networks would have would, like this information isn't something that they don't know. And it's just it's also really interesting when talking to people um, stateside who are like, "What? Who are these people? When did this happen? How did this know?" And like. So the ways in which the United States continuously condemns uh, nations for their censorship. Um, but when we look at like what actually happens here and how very, very little the uh, American people know, um, even myself, like some stuff, even as, and we say this every time, like when we're researching some of this stuff, it's just like, how did I not know this? And granted, a lot of this took place far before we were born, but even now so like my i was chatting with my granddad about this because his birthday was yesterday um and i asked if he knew some of the stuff and he was just like no <laughs> i did not and these things aren't taught even now we look at history being erased in schools and so it just further pushes this notion that america paints this one-sided picture and even looking at the ways in which in the congo itself that america was able to manipulate people and get people to see themselves as less than um, and then do their dirty work for them. It's just bad. Yeah, it pisses me off. Yeah. I mean, I think Terrell's silence was like the best way to describe <laughs> Like Bro, I, I when you read it, it's just like, damn, man. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And I mean, I've, I read this book almost twice now and it's hard reading it the second time just because, you know, you miss stuff first time you look at the detail like man they just i mean if it wasn't if there wasn't real stakes at it you'd be like damn these motherfuckers are are clever as shit because they really just you know they say you think of everything like they just yeah i think even the first time i like to cam's point that america just puts a 
a shade over everything. Like they, we write our own history. I didn't even know about Patrice until not thoroughly until like, you know, we started doing, uh, you know, research for this episode and started, you know, reading and watching the videos we, we do before we record and whatnot. And then if before that, I think me and black maybe had a light conversation about it and that's about it. Yeah. And like I said, it's, it's a whole anniversary of the world would probably be different, you know, but if that did, if this didn't happen, Patrice Lumumba had a profound dream. Are y'all ready? Like, wow, crazy dream. Like, just what was this man thinking? He was like, the people of the Congo should be the primary ones to benefit from the resources of their land. Astounding. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, bro. What? The most radical thing I've ever heard in my life. Wow. Like, what? wrong with this nigga you know what i'm saying like why yeah, why would hold you your, hold your horses there yeah like what are you thinking sorry buddy um so yeah it just so he he thought that the copper that goes in your wires the rubber that goes in your tires and the uranium that goes in the nuclear bombs uh should be controlled by the people who live on the land and in which and, we, and in which it all comes from um uh, for that the cia um as proxy of the US, united states government the Belgian government, um, British intelligence, and a, and a sleigh of um, Uncle Tom Congolese um, plotted to assassinate him. They claimed he was a secret communist plotting with the Soviets. Um, now, to be fair, sharing is a communist principle, but in the West, particularly the United States, only believe sharing when, like Terrell said, when it's dictated on their terms. Um, when white capital steals the bulk of the wealth and the rest of us eat the bribes they pay us so we can keep working to increase their pocketbooks. That's their version of sharing. The audacity of Lumumba and the Congolese people is that they thought they that is that they thought they could set the terms of how the resources should be shared. Again, what what were they thinking? Um, this time of the year, you will hear a lot about this nice Santa Claus black guy named Martin Luther King and days of service and how we should treat each other equally. Um, they will ask the redundant question like they do every year. Um, has his dream been fulfilled or has it been realized? But this watered down question never gets to the heart of how so-called equality is even measured. What is equal rights when you don't have clean water? What is fairness when you're starving, but the diamonds from your land are somewhere in a faraway place hanging around a cracker's neck or on their hand? Um, what white supremacy is often reduced to the hatred of another race, but really it's just a rationalization to loot. It's a reasoning logic to say white, white, white people don't have to share. Thus, the resources that come from the earth that allow for all of us to live should be controlled by a tiny group of thieves. It's this logic that rationalized the assassination of Lumumba in the Congo, uh, that uh, rationalized the CIA-backed coup of Lumumba's mentor and friend Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana. In 1965, it rationalized the CIA fascist coup in Guatemala and so on. Um, none of these gentlemen were technically communists, but it didn't matter because they wanted to control the uranium, the gold, and even the bananas of their own country. Look up um, United Fruit, um, Arbanez in Guatemala. And for this, uh, the collective West said it was communism. Um, so don't be fooled by these BS calls of racial harmony when they're not talking about shit that comes out of the ground. If we're not talking about if we're not talking about that, then there really ain't nothing to talk about. There are no rights to be had. If we're not talking about that. If we're talking if we're not talking about the resources on the land that come from the land, then there's no equality to discuss. Uh, so we dedicate this episode to Patrice Lumumba, who uh, Malcolm X said was the greatest black man who ever walked the African continent. His assassination changed the direction of the 20th century and therefore deserves our study. So let's get into it. I right, so so yeah, like we said, you know, I'm gonna delve into this. So we wanted to look at not just Patrice Lumumba as an individual, but we, like we do on the show, we want to understand the broader contextual details, the material world that influenced the moment that we're talking about. The the that ultimately leads to the assassination. So we're gonna go all the way back because man, again, he's from the Congo. Uh, we want to go all the way all the way back to when the Congo. It's colonized. Now, we're not going to go any further back, but it is important to recognize that life existed 
<laughs> decent life existed prior to slavery or colonialism. So we're not saying that the world starts with that. But for our sense of focus or our sense of study, that's where we're going to start. The con the conquest of the Congo go back to 1869. Um, the owner of the New York Herald. This is out of a bio from uh, that we that we read on Lumumba. Um, says employed the 28 year old um, re reporter to search for the missionary adventurer David Livingstone, who was presumed lost in the Congo um, over a period of 20 of 20 years. So this the name of this person, this reporter was Henry Morton Stanley. And he went into the Belgium supposedly to look for this person. And then he starts. Supposedly. Making, yeah, supposedly. And then he starts writing. He starts writing about how glorious this place is and how profitable it can be. Um, so he said in every cordial face aborigine whom I meet, I see a promise of assistance to me and redemption of himself from the state of unproductiveness in which he presents himself. Cause you know, niggas is lazy. They ain't doing nothing until white folks show up. Right. So God forbid um, you just live yeah. a nice calm life, taking care of your, your farm, your family, your children, being community together. Yeah. And not, not a slave. Yeah. Lazy ass niggas. Yeah. So, as I, I look upon him with much of the same regard that an agriculturist views his strong limbed child. He is the future, a recruit to the ranks of soldier laborers. A Congo basin, could I have but enough to his class, would become a vast productive garden. So he's just basically saying this is a place we can exploit and make a lot of money out of. And like I said earlier, they use racism, white supremacy as a rationalization to not share and to steal. So that's this it was song. disgusting. Yeah. He, it was really not rough. even just again, not even just against people, but he even like d talked about the goods and and like wanting to pillage them. He was like, it may be presumed that there are about two hundred thousand elephants and about fifteen thousand herds in the Congo Basin, each carrying, let us say, on average, fifty pounds weight of ivory in his head, which would represent, when collected and sold in Europe, five million pounds and it's like and y'all know how i feel about elephants that uh, like people are my my heart but elephants are my other half of my heart and that shit i was just like how and i'm just and, like how can you just discuss him human i hope he's fucking burning yeah. in hell and it's like when people are there to take stock basically yeah and when people joke about calling you know from the black panther shit calling folks colonizer and shit it's like this is what that actually is Colonizer is not just a white person that gets on your nerves, you know, like this is actually what this this is the mindset of a colonizer, like legitimately, I'm going to come in here and I'm we're going to take all your shit, you know, he like, was doing inventory. Yeah, yeah. He is literally there <laughs> yeah. observing people living like what's living. Um, people are not in bondage. People are living, having a normal society, having a calm happy esque life and this man is literally walking around with paper and pen being like mm. oh strong muscles dollars like just even thinking through some of this reminded me of the ways in which we've learned about how people were on auction blocks and like literally being talked about based on teeth and arm size and body size it, it was disgusting yeah like he was casing the country yeah before yeah, they like, robbed, like before you robbed, robbed. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. He was casing, yeah, yeah. he was casing like, them. <laughs> like, yo, they got that shit over there, they got this, and you know, uh, you hey, know, bro, that's gonna look good. In my we living. got people, we <laughs> got animals, yeah. they got some good soil. Oh, shit, you see that nigga got... right there. Did you see how he just threw that 50 pounds? Like, you see, you, you see, yeah, that nigga? like he's yeah, gonna yeah. give you a lot of money one day, yeah. <laughs> it's like, so, so he like, was we, like, we laugh, but the shit is the shit was real, yeah. And, it's like, and initially he was uh, initially he was and to to Rail's point when you case and like because that's even if you know anything about the even like the way people think of it now like you sell to the highest bidder so you might go around you case the people's homes you case the the situation and then you're like I'm not gonna do it but I'm gonna tell them I'll lay out the the floor plan and I'm gonna sell it to whoever wants it right so and I'm gonna just make mine on the back end. right so that's literally what happened like he went around he was trying to go to uh to the British and they ain't want to do with it so he's like hey I'm gonna talk to King Leopold the second which is wild because he was like <laughs> y'all niggas been colonizing the rest of the damn continent you don't want this place yeah. Which, so, I mean, that was a, that was a, you, it was a common practice. Like, you about to send somebody there, 
case to join out before we, you know, we do our thing. Like, what do you think really Christopher Columbus is was like, doing? That's not even what he was there for, right? It's like, this man is so sadistic in his mind and like, to where his original, and we're, I'm using finger quotes for those who are just listening to the audio yeah. mission, was to be looking for a person. I don't know nobody sent his money to a whole other country just to look for a person, whatever. And but, I don't know if he ever he, found this person to be. No, I've, ne- never, I've, never, I, I've never looked that part up. I don't know if that even happened. But he found a bunch of persons. But in the but in the in the midst of that, literally, it's just like actually, I don't care how I got here, but I know something else I could do while I'm here. And it's like Britain, y'all want to come uh, continue to colonize? Uh, various countries on the continent and they're yeah, like, like no nah. we've we've actually colonized too much we don't have enough money right yeah, now yeah we're we're we're, we're spread a little thin you know so so you know. so he goes to the belgians who the belgians um king leopold who's over there's belgians in belgium just because if you hear me mix it up um and he goes to he goes to king leopold the second and a quick little side note on belgium belgium had just become a country in 1830. So they weren't, they're new in the game relative to the other colonial powers. Like the British have been at this for hundreds of years, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, like they've been at this for a minute, you know, they're vets, like they're old money in this sense, right? The yeah. Belgium is is new, like they've, they've just kind of formed, they don't have as strong of a, what we call bourgeoisie or like a, a, a class, a merchant class. So the king really just runs this, the shit, doesn't have to compete with anyone else. Um, so when he goes to to King Leopold um, in, in June of 1878, uh, by the end of the year, he was employed on a contract work, worth up to uh, 50,000 francs. I think that's roughly 250,000 euros, not um, United States money is about 250,000 euros today, or at least at the time of the writing of that book. Um, so he goes in and it's also important to note, King Leopold actually never sets foot in, in the Congo. He's never, he never got there. Like he's, he never went there despite the destruction that we're going to get to that was caused by this man. He never actually shows up in the Congo. So this man did all this shit without even having to physically be there, you know? Um, so he's got foot soldiers to to follow the rules. So starts with a bunch of bad treaties. Um, like one of the treaties, like in return for one piece of clothes, they would go to like um, they would go to African leaders in the in the space. And it's important to note, as we'll get to later, we've always had Uncle Tom's. We've always had people to sell us out. You know, and yeah, there were people who also were genuinely confused and didn't know any better because if you came to somebody in a treaty in Africa, it didn't mean the same as what Europeans did. So we thought we was having a fair trade. But there's also a language barrier, right? So he was it'd be like one piece of cloth per month to each of the undersigned chiefs, again, the chiefs, besides presence of cloth in hand, they promised to fr- and in exchange freely of their own accord for themselves and the heirs and successors to ever give up to the said association the sovereignty and all sovereign governing rights to all their territories and to assist by labor otherwise any works improvements or expeditions which he said the association shall cause at any time to have carried out in any part of these territories so a few cloths for your whole land some clothes it's for- wild it's also just interesting though like when you read the language that the treaties initially were were stated like the amount of ways in which this was probably misconstrued even reading it now i was like this doesn't make any sense i could only fathom people showing up with boatloads of goods and guns and all the things it might be like you know this is right after the slave trade is abolished because we know it kept going for a long time and folks are like okay, this this sounds decent. And of course, it's always the trash-ass people who are just thinking like, me and mine are fine, we'll stay fine. But to think about the ways in which for their heirs and their successors and their successors, like to just be swindled the way this was just forever pisses me off. And it's just a testament to then and now and forever. Read your contracts, read the terms and conditions. Yeah. If you don't know what the fuck it says, yes. find somebody who does. It's like I, I I gave you a I'll give you a snapback for the whole mall. <laughs> <laughs> so 
those one-liners today y'all, <laughs> are going to bring me so much joy. Bro, here's a snapback. I'm gonna give you one snapback a month for the whole ball, and I get them all. <laughs> And then my children get them all, <laughs> and their this is children. A perpetuity, get... By the way, this yeah. is a perpetuity, by the way. <laughs> like everybody gets the ball, like but bro. This snapback. Look at this shit. Like this. This is, this is nice. You are now hooked into a three hundred and sixty deal for life. Yeah. So it's important to know it wasn't just treaties. It was also just military conquest. Like as they're giving the treaties, they're bringing in the military, and this is happening hand in hand. So it's not like they went around and just got treaties. But it is said that. He came back with like 500 different treaties like um, um, Stanley came back with like 500 different treaties that fucked this all up and then brought it to King Leopold. So it was it was bad. But again, they're bringing in a military to back up these treaties. So the moment that people realize I got fucked, like now there's a gun in their face. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's like it's not like they just get like. Because if you don't have nothing to back that up, then I could just be like, yo, you stole my money, give it back, and you can't do anything if you ain't got nothing to back it up. But clearly they they did. But, you know, um, so it just keeps getting worse. And then we've talked about, I think, on the show multiple times, the Berlin conference. We're not going to get deep into that um, for the sake of time. But one of the one of the tenets of the Berlin conference, it was it, people call it the scramble for Africa. But it's not that they weren't colonizing prior to 1884 and 85 where this conference occurs. Uh, but it was to bring some level of peace in like, okay, this is your territory. This is our territory, whatever. So officially in this conference um, where these European powers met up to decide what part of Africa belonged to them, <laughs> um, they said that King, King Leopold, they officially recognized his section as the Congo, you know, um, euphemistically under the name the International African Association or what becomes the International Association of the Congo or uh, the, the Re- Congo Free State, you know, which is a funny name. Um, the states aimed at the new Belgian colony were to abolish slavery. Because that was another thing during the Bel- the um, Berlin Conference. They said, we're going to abolish slavery. So in some cases, if you read like Watson Rodney's work, he talks about how the the same European powers who started slavery then employed people to go to war to end slavery so they could impose colonialism. <laughs> like It was like a very clear transition. So I don't think sometimes they had to fight with some of the Arabs who were doing slavery too to impose this. So some folks will say, well, the Berlin Congress, you know, the defenders and apologists of, of the of, colon, of, of colonialism will say, well, the Berlin Congress was anti-slavery. You know, it was a, it was actually like a good thing. You know, just like some people like to say United States is an anti-colonial country or something, which all these things are funny, but you get the point. So they wanted to promote free trade because, again, capital was changing up. Remember, 1884 coincides with other parts in the world. You know, you had the Civil War in 1865 here. So slavery is not as popular. That version, shadow slavery, they're now they want to do more free trade because they build up some of the industries. So now we need to have people that we can pay a little bit to. This didn't really yeah. apply to folks in the colonies, though. They wasn't making no money, you know what I'm saying? But especially in the Congo, one of the worst situations you could think of. Um, <clears throat> so just to give a little background, some of the business that was done in the Congo and some of the atrocities that happened as well. Uh, so like I said, it was the International Association. Uh, these businesses could operate with impunity in their territory, and they were allowed to raise taxes between 6 to 24 francs each year per head of the population. Um, so when villages run cooperative, and this is what a lot of people know about King Leopold, uh, Leopold's new model army, the Force Publique, destroyed homes, raped, and killed to prove action had been taken. The hands of victims were removed for the payment of the bounty. So they used to cut off people's hands. Um, this, and, and, and King Leopold like was one of the most famously known. Now this practice still happens, right? Like we hear about kids' hands getting cut off in you know in diamond mines and stuff like that. That practice is still around. They would cut off people's hands. Um, this is out of uh, this is a missionary. This is out of the White Malice book. A missionary describing being in Africa, and it's important to note it got so bad that even folks who were for colonialism was like this is getting out of hand. That's how bad this got. So they said. Um, Africans whipped to death, rivers full of corpses, and a detail that quickly seared into the world's imagination, piles of severed hands. 
Um, each time the corporal goes out to get rubber, explained an American missionary in Congo in 1899, cartridges are given to him. He must bring back not all, all not used, and for everyone, he must bring back a right hand. Um, informed, they, they informed the state official six months they stay on the Mavoya River had used some 6,000 cartridges, which means that 6,000 people are killed or mutilated. In fact, he added, the number was more than 6,000 for he had been told repeatedly that soldiers killed children with the butts of their guns. You know, like this is the Congo. So this is what Patrice Lumumba eventually comes out of. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, and this is to kind of close the door on, because I don't want to, some of this is just too much. But ultimately, like, um, in 1891, there was 20 million people in the Congo, 20 million Congolese. By 1911, there was 8.5 million. Like, that's how much slaughter King Leopold yeah, and his people put upon and, them. Well, repeat that time frame one more time. 1891, 20 million. 1899, 8.5 million people. So you have a reduction of almost 12 million people in Na- in like 20 years basically you know so yeah and literally if you have the stomach for it you can just watch a documentary on what took place in the Congo you can do a simple google search and click images will give you enough photos to uh, make sure that you don't I'm glad you didn't well. put that documentary in the research yeah, there was, yeah, this is something I, was, again, wanted to get through this as quickly as possible, but it's just important that people know, because some people don't know what preceded, and it also helps us understand why folks would want independence <laughs> um, and what folks are really up against, the type of people you were up against. So, like I said earlier, eventually King Leopold is so bad that eventually he is removed. Like his own country is like, no. Now, like I said earlier, it was an this country was wasn't as old, so they didn't have as strong of a bourgeoisie class who could kind of push back on this shit. Cause some of this was just fucking with money. If if 12 million people are dying in 20 years, at some point you this is leading towards extinction. So it's like we can't hold this up anymore. So they they pushed him out. But to do that, um, he still got, uh, let me see, um, the preamble of the deal saw the government pay King Leopold a sum of 110 million francs, effectively releasing his control of the Congo and alleviating his debt. So just like they paid slave owners and shit, you know, after slavery, they paid the king, like, here's your cut. You know, take your take your cut. You take the equity you have in this and get out. We're going to make this, we're going to take this somewhere else. I don't know what that is in euros, but that is a hell of a severance package. Yeah. Which is crazy. Bro. It's not like things got better, though. No. Like, what's, what's really interesting, though, is that, um, you know, the leader of your nation is complicit in everything that goes on. It's not like he wasn't getting reports of all of these things. Um, but it's also interesting how so many of the people that were on the ground that were overseeing these, so much of the military, so many of these those generals were not held accountable for the disgusting atrocities that were taking that, that were taking place. Yeah, um, like we said, King Leopold was ne- never went there. Never. So and so th- that always yeah. for me is, is hey, something even if- that when which is why I think like this this often uh, which is not something we're going to dive into a correlation for folks to talk about this in regards to uh, not having the same type of. Um, outrage that the Holocaust did and not as there wasn't this like mass speaking of parties that were all responsible in this being held accountable which also pisses me off um, because this wasn't just like King Leopold that he signed off on every single thing that was taking place but the things that were happening on the ground were all those folks need to also be held accountable and I hope each of them and their ancestors are all having the worst lives possible yeah, and and this is why you know people want to talk about reparations. Like it's it's just silly to talk about it solely within a your the American context. <laughs> you know when you got some shit like that, and and this is just 
I mean, it's not it's uh, it's not right to call it one atrocity because if we're talking about twelve million people, this is like one episode, I should say, in history among many others, right? So it's like Three year episode, yeah. So it's this is like yes, yeah, it's, it's not a not a good thing. Um, <clears throat> so there was pushback. I always like to note these things because I don't want folks to ever think we were just sitting around dying and getting killed. So I also want to make sure we emphasize like there there was pushback and there was like nobody just sat around and took this shit. So the Batella soldiers were concentrated in uh Lululaburg, who were and and the Batella soldiers were is the group. Batella is the group that um Lumumba comes from, you know. Um and they rose up and took control of the camp, killing um in in uh, January fourth, nineteen eighty five eighteen ninety five. They killed the captain of of one of the one of the folks of the Belgians. Killed the lieutenants. Fled the camp. Mutiny became a revolt and soon covered the whole region of Lumani. Um, they were confronted, but mixed results. By October 1896, as many as five thousand uh, Batella armed themselves and moved towards Gandu. So, anyone's ever heard about maroons? Um, you know, were you? You kind of like create your own autonomous territory and you escape the, the plantation, you run up in the hills and they can't fuck with you because they can't really come up and get you. Like this is similar, similar here kind of what ends up happening. Mm-hmm. Not all the not all the people did it, but that was definitely part of history to acknowledge. What's up? I said they went off the grid. <laughs> yeah. Um <laughs> but once once oh, I'm on it today, I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> you got all the this you synthesizing. Um well, all so once the the reforms were put in place, reforms uh, after Leopold to basically like slow down the killing. Um, it was also at a time where technology is changing, so you saw rapid growth and in some of the industrialization of the country, and they they started creating more schools and things of that nature. And this is the world that Lumumba is born into um, in um, nineteen in uh, nineteen twenty five, July second. Um, he's born into a world in which you know some of these things have started to change. So when he's born into the world, they started doing this ethnic chiefs thing, which that is not a problem just in the Congo. That is one of the, an issue with throughout Africa is talks about in this book, uh, prior to the intrusion of the Belgian ethnicity was relatively fluid. Uh, another reason why these tests don't make sense, but um, <laughs> ancestry tests, <laughs> ethnicity was relatively fluid, developing its own political forms organization, which changed according to regional circumstances. So essentially, like you weren't you form cliques based on your circumstances, not simply by I'm just this tribe and that's that. But the colonial um, regime froze these formations into a system of local government. So a lot of these they needed it. They needed it in order to exploit it. Yeah. So a lot of these like formations that when people say they're part of this tribe or that and then they sell it back to us like that's just purely an African thing. There's still colonial like infusion there because those things got frozen to formations and they became like warring tribes. They might have had beef prior, but it wasn't as deep as it was once the colonizer walks in and like sees, okay, we can pitch you against each other. So and then they become like that becomes a pecking order to manage the populations. You give the chiefs a little bit more crumbs, you know, and they manage the folks to do whatever, like like any other exploitative capitalistic system. Um, so the white population starts showing up more you got more settlers i think by the time Lumumba was born it was like almost eighteen thousand white folks or about about the 30s i believe it's about eighteen thousand white folks that moved in primarily from obviously from belgium and then some americans and some britons lived um within there um so production grew people grew and uh, so when Lumumba was born as ours he's born in the village of uh analu in the territory of Kato Kumbe in the Kasi province for the village of the Nalu to experience the colonialism was brutal. Villagers were forced to work for new masters, leaving them sometimes for weeks to tap rubber in the surrounding forest so they could meet the targets set by the colonial authority. Um, wow. but, but in the midst of this, you know, Lumumba and many others was figuring things out. So Lumumba was a vociferous reader. Uh, you know, he was he was a really intelligent student, even though there really wasn't a lot of education in the area to give him. Uh, he even get, used to get in trouble for correcting teachers who would mess up words. And he'd be like, no, nah, that's not how you say it. And they would try to kick him out of school. Sounds like it. somebody else we know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, like, you know, he was he was a, he was a smart kid, you know, and he just loved reading. That was one of the main things about him. 
Um, you know, we were talking off air about some of the similarities between him and Malcolm X, like, you know, very intelligent, grew up in, in poverty, but were just bright individuals who were able to make their way out of it to some extent and also had a major arc in their growth, especially towards the end of their lives. Um, and they both just like wanted more. And I mean, yeah. I think inherently most people want more for themselves, but they had like this intrinsic desire to just do more be better and i think that's like what pushes him to move to stanleyville which also sickens me uh stanleyville yeah considering considering who we we named who stanley was so (laughs) so (laughs) So, that's where his name and there's a leopoldville there's yeah um so um oh my god yeah so, you know, we're not going to get too much into his personal life. He did have children. He was married, I believe, three times. Um, and we're going to quote his daughter a little bit here just to because she named some things. But at the same time, we're more so in- interested in the political part. Um, so his, his, like, like Cam say, moved to Stanleyville, um, which is a city. He was in more of a village, so he wanted to live in a city. And a lot of, and, and that was another thing. When we talk about his capitalism in general. We kind of talked about this on the Marxism episode, like cities were a way of building these new enclosures. So you want to force people off some of these villages into cities so you can boost your production. Um, this didn't just happen in Africa. This happened at this time. This was happening everywhere or really across the world. Um, anywhere that had, you know, capitalism, which at this point was basically everywhere. Um, you can control them more than you can't, yeah. con- you can't drive out two hours yeah. out to the middle of nowhere to somebody's land where they didn't even have very few neighbors and think that you were going to be able to tell them yeah. what the hell to do when you can't be there. But, but convincing folks to move to the city was a, also a mechanism for containment and control. Yeah. We mentioned that in an episode we did, uh, not last year, but we, it was a while ago. I think Rasul, because he deals with geography, yeah. he talked about this, um, and this is in his book, Geography is a Threat. Like He does a great job explaining like cities and how they were built for this creation exactly to push exactly. The production of capital. So yeah. Um so his daughter described like what life was because again they had segregation everything as well. So when you reached 18, if you were stopped, you had to justify why you were in town. This is life in a city of the Congo. You were a domestic yeah. servant and you would be allowed to continue mm-hmm. on your way. Even if today you will notice that people refer to the sites or this I think that city This is where black people live while the whites lived in the town. There were also curfews. So after six o'clock, if you were not working, you did not have the right to be to move around. And if a black man looked at a white woman, he could find himself in prison. So this sounds very similar, you know, to experience over here. Uh, So just kind of jumping forward, a quick time jump here. Uh, So, again, Lumumba was um, a postman and and he kind of and for for a black person at the time. That was a pretty high paying job, um, you know, relative to black folks. And then like and it's also important to note the Congo, even compared to other colonies, was really terrible at like developing people. So there wasn't a lot of folks who had skills really across the board that could like run a nation. And this becomes an issue later on. And this is an issue for other countries when you're trying to become independent. The white folks did all the administrative jobs in many cases, so there yeah. wasn't people who were trained to do those jobs, you know. Even in the schools that they had, they weren't. They weren't. You weren't taught much. Nah, you yeah. barely even had college graduates. You barely had like just people who had skills that are needed to do things. Like, like even at that time, they, they were they were only going everything. to school for a specific till a specific age, and then once you were at age, if you were allowed to go to school at all, you were just sent off to go work. Yeah, there was like no such thing as secondary education or you know higher learning or whatever. It, it, it wasn't a thing. No, nah, not for most of them. There's a few, and this is where you get to the, um, it's called e- Evole, um, w- which w- is French for evolved. Um, and if you were an Evole, we're going to talk about what that meant. You could get into a certain um, kind of category. <laughs> So in, in 1954, while living in Stanleyville as a postman, on February um, 5th, 1954, Lumumba was notified that he had been 
recorded in the Register of Civilized Indigenous Population. This is actually a category at the time, a category of S- Register of the Civilized Indigenous Population um, to achieve the status of registered in the Belgian Congo. So that's what an evolve was. Like you were evolved because you had European traits. Because they, they considered everyone else savages. Yeah. They felt that there was no, and, and they used that to justify continued colonization in the Congo. Like, and you got a special what? status to be like not so uncivilized. <laughs> you are not a savage in yeah, their eyes. So you, so you need a stamp in order yeah. to do it. The way his daughter describes the, the humiliating process in order to do it um, was just ridiculous. She talks about how she said you would be given a test and someone would come to your house, essentially a social worker will come to your house and see if you had a toilet, if your kids wore pajamas, if you ate with a fork and knife, um, and only then would you be given this, like, accreditation. You know, it's just, and that's disgusting. And I think, like, even when we look at the parallels to today of, like, what folks view as um, an acceptable lifestyle, uh, and, and just to take things that, if it doesn't fit a European standard of what is acceptable, then it's automatically demeaned. So they're testing assimilation status. Yeah, and and again, there Period. was, there was a, as a quote I didn't put in here, but there was like oh, other. Yeah. They had different categories of people, like so they had like savages, and they were like labeled in your these categories. It's a way to people to strive for stuff, and you give them the status. So it's not. It's something that they only can gra- you can only graduate by them giving it to you. It's not something you can just make more money and they'll be like, no, you had to live a certain kind of way, and then you became a nouvelle, um, and you and you were evolved in European civilization. So that so you imagine that very small people who got that status reflected those ideas. So they will want to pass down like we need to act more like Europeans, you know. So even 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 Lumumba, this is what we were saying. Well, Lumumba evolved so quickly. Because even Lumumba at one point was really caught up in this. Like, it's just important to note that. So Lumumba said in some of his early writings, um, the deliverance from fear, the freedom of life, the sense of human dignity, is it not to Stanley and Leopold who we owe it? Um, who delivered us from famines, devastating ep- epidemics? Was it not Stanley and Leopold? Stanley gave us peace, rendered us in our human dignity, improved our physical existence, instructed our intelligence, developed our souls. Now, I don't know, maybe he was pandering because this is what, you know, keeps the status. I don't know, but like, he evolves, <laughs> no pun, out of that. <laughs> Obviously, once we get to the end, y'all, it'll be very clear. But it's just to show you, like, he, you like, this is... Say he got woke. Yeah, he he <laughs> broke, you know, talk about, like, breaking out of a of a, of a hex, you know, yeah. but like, yeah. it, he, he wasn't he wasn't an anomaly. Like, this is how the, the small group of people who got Uvali's status were the few kind of educated people in the country who, you know, eventually go to lead the, the, the independence movement, right? Because they were experiencing, they were still experiencing discrimination. They were still treated like niggas, but they had a little bit of status, right? Like, so we see how there's similarities, even though it's different how it works here in some way than other places. Like, niggas don't have anything in America technically called that but you hear it in the language, <laughs> you know, yeah. what I'm saying? like you hear it in the language, like when folks start talking about alpha male and stuff. It's very still the very eugenic based, like European centered argument. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, class yeah. status, education yeah. status. Yeah. Oh, you, you're not, if you don't have a degree, Oh, you're less than you don't make X, Y, and Z amount of money. Oh, you choose to, I mean, I think even we see this type of notion when we, you look at people who live in the in, in the city versus the country and the way that sometimes we and we've discussed this before the way that people sometimes look down on elders who refuse to deal with some of this shit or don't subscribe to the same uh notions that society tells them that they need to and for that it's like oh no you're you're just like a backward ass nigga for that versus being versus viewing it actually as something to be cherished and to actually strive towards is this removal of ourselves from what is seen as evil. And thankfully, you know, every now and then you just gotta go to jail in order to wake your ass up. And that's yeah, what so, happened to Lumba. So he, I got he a question did. though. Go ahead. Um, so even with these labels and these titles that they put on them, and at least in my mind, like with that label that time, it was like, okay, look, you're you're one of these people now. You've you've risen through the ranks, per se, I guess. 
even then, like that still kind of puts a target on your back that, hey, this nigga is somebody, th- these are the group of niggas we might have to watch out for. Yeah. Cause and it's a way of it's a way of taking the intelligent black folks, and again, I'm not saying the others weren't, but I'm saying intelligent in the eyes, minds of white folks, and taking and and putting them in a place where they're not threatening. Because you know that's always a contradiction. Is the more you learn, the more you're like, okay, these white folks are still in front of me. So how do you dissuade them from that? You create some category. Some gotta, yeah. Some point you got to think like these niggas gonna figure out like right. Like, when we did like hey yo yo this shit ain't and right. they and they did right you know what I'm saying but like, but it didn't work. But I'm just saying you trying to figure out a way you know like I always say like that black rage is gonna show up. So you're just trying to figure out a way to funnel it in a way that doesn't affect your your bottom line like as the as the person or as the people in power but yeah, yeah it was it was um inevitable you know that that would happen i want to read a few more of these categories there was um there was control of desirables and the ejection of undesirables um to do this they divide the native population between professional unemployed parasites people living without funds and boys deemed unsatisfactory it's just some of the categories you know so, yeah so so they set up a, a hierarchy that people are trying to like you know race out of and then you know so so anyway but again there's still contradictions so as Lumumba's trying to do this you gotta you gotta live this aristocratic lifestyle so you gotta host parties at your house and you gotta appear extravagant so we just see that even today with like black celebrities who don't have the money that it appears they have they have to flex to hold the status so Lumumba was trying to flex all the status, but he was running out of money. So what he would do was he would take money from his job and transfer the money to his account so he could maintain the status. And then eventually he gets he gets caught, even though he's putting some money back in, he gets caught for embezzlement. And he had been writing to them, yo, I'm not getting paid enough money. White people get more money than me. I'm doing more work. He had been writing to them. But yeah. at that time, he was still in the phase of advocating for his class or whatever you want to call it. Um but he gets caught for embezzling the money and then he gets sent to prison. And this is where he starts, you know, breaking out of this, at least the way I've read. And there are different interpretations of the way I've read the history. This is where you start seeing, at least in his writings, you start seeing because he, he had been a writer up to this point. Like we read some of this other stuff he was writing. So you start seeing him being more critical of Belgium, you know. But this is 1956. What's amazing is by 1958, in two years, he's leading the nationalist movement. For independence in the country so just imagine the jump in 54 he gets information that has yeah. to take place in order to do so <laughs> in, in 54 he gets this status by 58 he's leading he's leading the country to for to, towards independence like and, that and it's like fuck that status yeah. that status means nothing <laughs> yeah Bro, and, his... and i think that there's a there's a humbling there's like a level of humility and awakening that that takes place during this time because you know what well, when we what we know about caste systems is it's, it's a way to separate and so you are not especially in the city you're not going to potentially be around all the same people or all the same people in your class not now in this space everyone is of the same you are all nothing according to them and so i can only imagine not just the ways in which you know people they talk about like his public speaking skills increase the way his knowledge increases he's always been a learner a reader and observer and so i can only imagine the conversations that take place that really challenged him into thinking past this notion of being an eboule and like what what does it mean in, to be better than some and less than others when you're now at square one with everybody and you're seeing who they have made you see as less than because like when we look at what he was saying and paying homage uh, in his mind to stanley and to leopold and now being in this space of like you had me thinking my own people weren't shit because they, they weren't like where you. i am because they, they didn't, didn't act, act like, like white folks. Yeah. But now, you know, and, and some of this came about just from, you know, some panhandling and some scamming in jail selling beer. <laughs> <laughs> like literally, you know, they, they, uh, there's a quote in the book that says, like, in his new position, he uses talents of oratory to persuade people to switch from Primus to Polar, which is a type of beer. And he rapidly learned the language of the region, the Lingala. But the work was vital in that it allowed him to a direct access to a wider public and certain communities far larger and more representative than the narrow world of Evole politics. And so, you know, it's literally that. It is this notion of like, in talking to people, in recognizing the humility 
um, and the humanity in others and in this notion of like, these are my people, not these fucking white people that I talk to on a daily mm-hmm. basis at work, not these other educated um, Belgians that are in my space, these British, these ones that may be able to read these books with me and talk with me in these circles, but these are my people. And this is where I, this is where the issue lies. Why are we even caged in this prison to begin with? And I yeah. think like that is what really transformed him. And I think that's also where like Malcolm's connection to him comes so so heavily as we saw that, you know, even though Malcolm would not have been considered any Vale in this space um, yeah. from <laughs> at all, from the <laughs> demon scamming and conniving he was doing before prison. <laughs> but I think so often, you know, and like we talk on the pod about like the work to release political prisoners and the work that we feel is just vital in recognizing the humanity of folks in prison, regardless of what they went there for. Um, but it is things like this. And he is just one of many, you know, even folks who get out of jail and just come home and just help niggas on the block get better, think better, be better people. It is because like they, they, they're in a space where they can see that all this other shit that takes place outside of it is useless. It is meaningless because we are oppressed by yeah. <laughs> from top down. And he steps out a completely different person and it's like, fuck this shit. Things have to change. And I want to be a part of it in any capacity of like how this changes. I think Black said it in another episode. And I, I wish I could call back to these episodes, but it's like, even as you know, us three here, we have different levels of educations, but we still acknowledge that Black people are still our people. We have to look out for them no matter what stage or you know what level they're at like they are still our people no matter if they're just you know the bum that you know i don't even want to call them a bum but just my 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 nigga that sits on you know on 38th and midhoffer that you know i throw a couple dollars to every now and then when i catch them at the gas station all the way up to you know either who's ever at my status or who's even higher than that these are still our people right Granted, some of those people at the top of the they can be more detrimental to us than harm. We still have to we still have to take accountability for them. Yeah, or or do or and do. when I say take accountability, yeah, I yeah, mean yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You got to deal with them. You got to deal with. Them. <laughs> so, they got to get dealt with. Yeah. Get dealt with. <laughs> so, but yeah, like yes, I mean, like Cam said, he leaves he leaves prison um, for the first time. He this will not be the last time, but he leaves prison for the first time. And, you know, he kind of breaks, he breaks it. And, and it's and it's interesting, like Cam said, like, when you're doing that kind of job where you got to sell, it's just selling beer. That's the job he took out of out of, out of out of jail. And he made decent money relative, again, all of this is relatively speaking, relative to what other people were making of his, that looked like him. But, like, you know, there was a quote, a uh, woman made the most of the new job to spread his political creed. According to one account, the budget, served as a political budget so because he had to always persuade people like it's i i've done and terrell has done sales this it sucks but you do learn certain skills and like you have to be able to just talk you know what i'm saying even when you don't like this person like you gotta be able to because that's how you that's how you eat you know what i mean so it's like yeah. like he learned and oh, then like man. like 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 i can't say he's talking to people who ain't you know, who who aren't just that little small group. So like it just and it's interesting when you think about like um thinking about Megar Evers, who was also killed around like not all these folks were assassinated within the same like I think Megar Evers was assassinated in 63. Um, but Megar Evers sold insurance um down in Mississippi. And 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 it was a very similar thing where like by doing those kind of jobs, you have to talk to people and you gotta go in their homes and you gotta like deal with their day-to-day situations it does form a connection and when you're in this particular context in the colonial context like it became a way of building bonds and there's another part where like beer was a way of bonding you know what i'm saying so yeah. like beer was a way i mean of, beer is still a yeah. way of bonding yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so when you talking politics over drinks like that honestly was way more deeper than just like your you know, the round tables that they do later on and some of that more like bourgeois stuff, like we're with the people. You so know, now that you agree, so now that you agree to that black, does that mean you can finally share a drink with me one day? No. But no. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'll answer that for you. <laughs> but... answer is no. It wouldn't be me if I didn't try. You got you you <laughs> we need keep one clear headed person and <laughs> you go keep trying. Um <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> so yeah, like I said, by fifty eight, he's he's um he's he's in the independence movement. He's elected the president of the movement uh movement national congolese that what would we will call the mnc on um october 1858 so like again the jump is just amazing and it does remind me of malcolm because you are if you think of malcolm's life it's like once they got it they just run with it like there's that's a special kind of person you know like they just you know um like they're, they're moving too fast for the rest of the world in some ways because they just once they get it it's just like it just clicks for them in ways that other people who might have been in the game longer just don't they don't have that that motor you know like both of them just had really high motors you know so within two months of becoming president he now is at what is what is famously known as the all african people's conference in accra ghana um led by in like what led by kwame and krumah like so he goes from evole to prison so now you're at the All African People's Conference, um, and the, and Ghana was the first country to uh, to get its independence, um, you know, of the colonized nations. It was the first country to get its independence in 1957. Mm-hmm. So you now you are a representative of your country <laughs> in the biggest conference that Africa had ever held up to that point under colonialism. You know, oh, that's z- that's zero to a hundred, right? There. Yeah, <laughs> it's just quick. Like, yeah, Wait, like real quick. <laughs> yeah, and it was funny. Like I'm gonna jump up the timeline and come back a little bit because it's like, I think I said it. He it's somewhere on here, but I I don't know the story. But like he he wasn't even initially supposed to be there. Like it's just crazy how life works. Like another another group um was supposed to originally go. He wasn't even originally supposed to be there. Um, even though he was representative of his party, there was another party that was more ongoing. The Abako party, uh, Kasavuvu, eventually becomes the president in tandem with when when Patrice becomes prime min- prime minister because um, they had to unite the government. Um, so Kasavuvu, the Abaka, the Abaka stood for the Alliance des Bakongo, um, wasn't allowed to attend it. Belgians wouldn't let him attend because he was already known as a leader of some of the independence movements. Um, and he came out of a party that used to just advocate for Evoli shit as well, right? Kasavuvu eventually is that's another conversation. Um, but the uh, Pan African Freedom Movement of East and Central Africa, including Tom Aboya, who was actually a CIA shield, but at this time I guess he was okay. But AR Mohammed Babu and um and Kanyamama Chiumi were on their way to Accra in December 1958 when their plane made a stop over in Leopoldville. There's, there's Leopoldville. They were impressed by Lumumba and determined to bring him to Accra together with fellow members of MNC, Gas and Diama and Joseph and Galu. So they just met they just met him and was like, yo. I love that. Yeah. We just, <laughs> I love black like people. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't even know who you are, but we have one, two, three conversations and it's like, oh, you're my dog. Which yeah. is I always laugh because that's how, you know, we became friends. So it's like, yeah. Yeah, What's just be, and yeah. here we are a decade later. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's that's literally how, like, black will tell you, that's literally how, like, I functioned all through college. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, I ran into people, we had conversations, and we kicked it and drank from there. Yeah, and then, and then, you know, like, like Cam said, and it's 10 years later, and we still talking, you know, what I mean, so. Yeah, that's not that part. But uh don't even smoke with me. Anyway, all this slander, man. But like uh <laughs> so just to give people a sense of the conference itself, because again, this was a big deal. So they were yeah. rep- they represented some 65 organizations from 28 African territories, including um colonies ruled by Britain, France, Belgium, Portugal, and Spain. Fraternal delegates and observers also came, including visitors from Canada. People's Republic of China, who just got independence in 18, 1949, of India, Indonesia, the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, the USA, Britain, and other European countries. Now, the USA was there through like other reps, but the, the White House and no official government people came. <laughs> like none of them were there. Just want to put that. They, they, they weren't really wanted there, no way. But no, you know, they, they were... send their spies and they send their people. They were there in other ways, but we'll we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so um, you know, uh, so like I said, 
Uma barely made it, but he did get there. And then the 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 general theme of the conference was hands off Africa. So this was really a push towards like you know anti colonialism and anti imperialism, right? And and this is after the Bandung conference that already happened, I think, in 1956. I believe that was the year. I might be no 1954. The Bandung Conference happened. The Bandung Conference was when um, I don't remember all the nations off the top of my head, but a lot of colonial colonized nations around the world um, came together from different, you know, who were colonized under different languages, different folks, same thing, and they and they formed what we understood. This is in um, Indonesia. They formed the um, non-alignment movement. We've talked about this before. This eventually becomes the third world, and like we talked about in the. Marxism episode that the third world was not poor people in some third rate place. It was like, we're going to have a third way that is not aligned with e neither the United States nor with the Soviet bloc. Right. So we're going to practice our own thing. We're not going to pick sides on that. So if we want to be capitalists, we'll be capitalists. If we want to be socialists, we'll be socialists. The non alignment movement, mo many of them did veer towards at least kind of a social democratic if not socialist but we're not going to take a line on that because we want to be able to determine our own futures and we don't want it to be determined by one of these blocks so the second world would be the soviet block and the first world was the the western col colonizing block because the soviets didn't colonize anyone uh you know in the, in the way that america or belgiums or whomever um you know so so that so Go ahead. Call, calling something a third world country is just. I don't know how it became that. I really, I've never looked that up. But I just know initially, like we talked about in in the Marxism episode, it was third world was yeah. was a positive thing. It's it's a third way. Without yeah. looking it up, it yeah. probably well, was because not propaganda that yeah. transformed it. I would probably doubt some CIA it, shit it was a slander fucking yeah. campaign. The CIA probably was in on it of like. We oh, cannot have them associating a new world order, a third world, as anything positive. So let us fuck this up. Yeah. I, that's not fact checked, but it, all, it all fingers point. It makes sense though. Like you're not, picking our, you're not picking our side, so third world. So we're gonna make that shit seem like trash. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, and and it's like it wasn't that these people didn't want to have relationships, or these countries didn't want to have relationships with the Soviet Union. Or the United yeah. States, it was just we're not going to be dictated by your program in the same way. Now it's important to know the Soviet Union had a lot of flaws. I'm not saying they were perfect, but they weren't nearly as you know dictating as the United States was. Like for whatever differences people might have, you look at a country like Cuba. Cuba had a much better life under being in conjunction with the Soviets than they did when they were ruled by the United States. I think we can all see that. And if Cuba is suffering now, it's because of sanctions put on them by the United States. With the with the non-alignment movement, which is not totally represented this conference, this is primary this is just Africa. Non-alignment had was in again, it was I believe in Indonesia and it was in and it was um Bandung and it was like different nations, you know, in, including African nations, but in that year, there were African nations didn't none of them were independent at that point, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I think you know. So yeah, it's just important to note that was going on. So Lumumba again is meeting these heads of states. I, I was also like like people like France Fanon was there. Uh, you know, one of my faves. You know, I, he was representing Algeria. You know, uh, and he's meeting he's meeting in Kruma and Kruma was actually supporting the uh, party with Kasavubu that I just named earlier. And then he switched his support to, and not just like verbal support, like giving funds, he switched support to Lumumba's party when he, by meeting Lumumba, because he was so moved by Lumumba. So they, they met and vibed out. But this is where we said the U.S. was represented in ways that may have not been, you know, as direct, because I think the White House did send Trash. a note or some bullshit. But so, again... And Kruma comes out of, they, you know, uh, Ghana was colonized by the British, so they speak English. Um, and then Belgium or the Congo was colonized by Belgium or by, so they speak um, mainly French. It's a few other languages, but they there's still like local languages, but the colonial language is primarily French. So Lumumba primarily speaking French or whatever his 
you know, native tongue was, and then you have Nkrumah speaking English, so they needed an interpreter. So then it was later found out years later that the interpreter of between these two gentlemen was a CIA agent. Fucking <laughs> op. <laughs> so, yeah, like I when I read that, I was like, whoa. You know, because one if there is a criticism <laughs> for those Terrell's listening, like, Terrell I'm walked sick. Terrell walked away. I'm sick. Um, Niggas can't have shit. Not even translation. Yeah. <laughs> they the, 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 many years this is in the mainly now we're mainly reading from the White Malice book for people who want to follow the text more. Sorry. Um Many years later, Nkrumah learned that Lamuma's interpreter at the AAPC, that's the conference, was a CIA agent. The interpreter facilitated a friendly introduction between Lamumba and the Americans at the conference, according to Thomas Kanza, a Congolese graduate of Lovinia University in Belgium. Um, so, and the reason, again, the U.S. doesn't want anybody, the U.S. didn't like non-alignment. They're like, like, like we talked about at the beginning, like Terrell talked about, like, if you don't get with us, you know, it's, it, what, is, what was it, Terrell? Get um, down and lay down. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you already know yeah. that the yeah. moment they was like these two niggas is talking oh it's a no for me dog no nah. if that shouldn't have been asap yeah that's not gonna work you gotta get down or lay down so you can't be a non-conformist you can't be a not or non-alignment my bad yeah. uh, non-alignist like which brings back to the point where the brings back to the point where cam was talking about like third war third war countries like they've made that such a terrible thing to look at, oh, they're so impoverished or this, that, and that. No, they just didn't pick a side. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but, but yeah, they didn't, they didn't, yeah, so like Like, hey, uh, you, got, you got good points going on over here, you got good points going over here. We don't want to join yeah, because we, we want to determine all. We want to determine all. We want to figure out our own thing. And if we we'll work with you though, that was the thing. None of these countries was like on some blatantly fuck America shit. They were a lot of them were on fuck their the people who colonized it directly. But this is another thing. America was was slick because America doesn't have the same baggage openly. America had not colonized technically. I think Liberia was a colony for all intents and purposes, but like. They hadn't technically colonized any any countries in Africa in the same way that the British or the Belgians or the French. Well, they profited the all the same. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying, I'm saying from the, the perspective, was, yeah. from the perspective yeah. of people in Africa, there was some some enthusiasm or some hope. It, it sounds wild to us today, but at the time that because the United States was you know, a, a country that did that was for pri- formerly a colony. This is again, this is their narrative. It's still a colony, but that was formerly a colony that broke away from the British or whatever and f- and found its own way. That narrative was inspiring to people who didn't really know much about the United States because you got to consider everybody's not getting education like that. There was no internet or anything now back then, right? So you can't just yeah. look shit up. So you didn't know. So Lumumba, you know, the book. White Malice and some other books I read talks about he was a little too nice in regards to Americans. He hated Europeans, to, you know, because he, he had, yeah, but like Americans, there was there was some folks who thought Americans weren't that bad. There's a part in the book where they talk about how Lumumba was yelling at someone. They're like, why are you yelling at me? He's like, my bad. I thought you were, I thought you were European. I didn't know you were from America. So Lumumba had a soft spot for Americans and that didn't necessarily work out. He learned later, but it might have been too late. So the, the the interpreter came up acting like he spoke French and it was actually a CIA dude, you know, like, hey, I can help you. Because, again, remember, Lumumba didn't really plan to go. So he didn't have all the the staff with him in a way that somebody who was planning to go. So he kind of just got an interpreter on the way there, you know. <laughs> so but it was a CIA agent. And so we learn about same way when they provide you a same way when they provide you a um, attorney when you go to your court case. <laughs> 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 this nigga's on a roll today. Uh, <laughs> Slander for the day. <laughs> when they assign, we know when they assigned you a public defender. Like, hey, look, I'm gonna look out for you. Then I know. I yeah, I'm about to turn you into prosecutor. Yeah, yeah. Let's hey, I just, you, if right, you ever, I mean, maybe for like a small case, you might get some help. But if you got some federal charges, the last fucking thing you should probably ever do is take the state appointed. <laughs> yeah, nah. <laughs> Nah, <laughs> you going to jail, big fella. Yep. Um. So just to give a little more background on like 
other because the CIA we'll get more into this in part two. The CIA was running deep, like they were deep cover. Uh, so Thomas, my boy, we talked about. Uh, I don't know why that says of the Congo. Thomas Boy was out of Kenya. Um, Google Congo. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Thomas Boya was out of Kenya. Um, he was tight with CIA trade unions, and he tried to get the conference to go with their trade union. That trade union is the um, the a the a the uh, AFL CIO um, had its was was part of a, a broader. Um, trade union the uh the icftu ICFTU. yeah sorry so many acronyms um but a lot of people jokingly call the afl cio the afl cia um because they were because they were so because they were so tight with uh (laughs) they were so tight with it because because there was trade unions there's like a you there's also the labor movement thing going on so there's trade unions who were trying to make way in africa so the CIA was like giving money to the AFL CIO. Um, so that's why they got the name AFL CIA. So the ICFTU um was the anti-communist international trade union that Thomas Maboya was part of and from Kenya. Maboya eventually is assassinated, actually. Um, and he was a C- he worked deeply with the CIA. He actually set up a program that that I that actually leads to Barack Obama's dad getting education. Uh, airlift Africa, I believe is what it was called, which was another CIA-backed program. But, you know, y'all can do what you want with that information. That's actually how I learned about this book. Uh, but like, so, um, so, but, so, but again, at that conference, just to give you a sense of the non-alignment, they, instead of joining either of the, like, international unions, because the, the communist-backed one was a World Federation of Trade Unions, um, they started their own um, union, the All African Trade Union Federation, just to give you a sense of trying to maintain their own independence um, within this space. So, but the CIA had all these other fronts there. So, one of the ones I don't have time to get into all of these, but the African American Institute <clears throat> was a CIA backed front that they set up. Um, it was established in 18, 1953 by a multiracial group of academics, a business of most powerful mining interests in Central Africa. <laughs> So some of the people had connections to the Congo. We'll get into that more in part two. The state aim of the AAI was to establish closer bonds between the peoples of Africa and the United States. It organized scholarship programs, teacher placements in Africa, and a variety of lecture information and visitor services. Um, Bob Keith, the chief editor of AAI Journal, Africa Special Report, was registered at the AAPC in Africa as an American press correspondent. And then this next part is interesting. In a dramatic moment, Keith was found hiding in the Accra Community Center during a closed session of conference, which was off limited to press. He was arrested by Ghanaian police who discovered recording equipment on his person. Of course, he's a <laughs> fucking odd bitch. All I'm going to say is... All, all his I'm name is Bob. His name is Bob. I ain't never met a Bob who was about nothing. <laughs> that you could trust? Yeah. That I could trust. I ain't never met a Bob I could trust. Hey, I just want to I just want to put this put this out real quick. This part two is gonna be epic. Yeah, because this part is, two is gonna be is, is in the worst way, but truly in it's, the worst way. But yeah, yeah, it's like an intricate web of what the fuck. And the yeah, more just we learn getting... about it, the more you read, you're just like the fuck. Yeah. It just keeps getting worse. I'm going to run, I'm going to, because I'm going to get into the independence conversation. So we're going to run through this last part. Just give you a few more fronts that we'll probably get into next episode. American Society of African Culture, another front. Uh, Cultural Congress of Freedom. Uh, Cultural Congress, Congress for Cultural Freedom, excuse me, was another front. And again, people didn't know these were fronts. So it makes you think about today too, right? But people didn't know these are fronts. So a lot of folks well-meaning would join these things or be part of these things or take money from these things only they to find out later help. on. that. And the, and I just want to name some of the funders, like, can't get into all of them, but, like, the Ford Foundation was one of the funders of some of these groups, you know, still around today. Um, Fairfield Foundation, Rockefeller, Carnegie. Yeah. Well, these motherfuckers was throwing money, you know, so I just want to Ford, or I said Ford, but, like, yeah, they were... Uh, Rob, Rob Childs, all these folks, right? So, um, so when folks throw out conspiracy theories, this isn't a conspiracy theory, and this was eventually exposed 
officially more than 225 different organizations operating in many parts of the world, including Africa, were identified as direct or indirect recipients of CIA funds. Some of them were specially created by the CIA, while others <clears throat> had been set up independently from agency and were then sponsored and funded by it. There were book publishing companies involved in this. Um, there was <laughs> there was there was all kinds of stuff. There's even stuff in this book talks about CIA had a had plane had actual like um airlines that were fronts. I mean, this is terrible shit, man. Um and again, the main point of this is the is a is it's called the cultural cold co- the cold war cultural fronts. And the point was to like get folks who had ideas and turn their interest towards the West. Like that this is this whole cold war fight against communism, quote unquote. So that, a lot of these fronts, you see people get caught up today. I don't know if they're funded by the CIA or not, but you see these things where people don't get part of these little collectives that turn their radicalism down or like i say they launder it elsewhere you know like that's what that's what this shit was um so ultimately the fight really comes down though with the in the congo and then we're gonna get to the independence and we're gonna be done to the actual like resources like i was talking about earlier in the congo you know again when stanley went in there he didn't just go there because he just liked the way the people look Here's some shit we can steal, you know. So the United States doesn't want to share, and, and he liked the way they looked. Clearly, uh, <laughs> but the people were part of this part of the theft. So you know, there's also that. But like, so the United States had already done business in the Congo, you know, with the with the Belgians, and one of the most you know um, notorious levels of business, uh, Congolese ore, essential for the Manhattan Project which produced the the world's first atomic weapons and was led by the United States with some assistance from Britain and Canada. The uranium was used to build the first atomic bomb to be tested, the Trinity test in New Mexico in July 1945, which launched the atomic age. It was also used to build atomic bombs that devastated Hiroshima and Nagasaki the following month on August 6th and August 9th, respectively. So the actual the actual like uranium that was used for the atomic bomb that, that blew up Japan came out of the Congo. <laughs> so you can understand why you don't want to let that go to some other country. Particularly, they're trying to keep it away from the Soviets, even though evidence showed the Soviets really didn't have a lot of like pool in the Congo. It wasn't a lot of them there. Probably wouldn't even have been able to do shit with it, but they claim they didn't want it to get into their hands. So they had to protect it, even even they if had it to included, steal it for themselves, yeah. you know. Even if it included God forbid it get into those commies' hands. So the sources of Chikolabwe mine in Katanga, the southern province of the Congo. Um, they actually well, we'll get to that part too. Um so yeah, the Chikolabwe mine was like invested, you know, by a lot of like West had a lot of Western money in it. And they were not going to give that away to some African nationalists. They were not going to do it. Um, so when we come back to independence, this is all, this is all in the air. Like this is, it was at stake. We don't want to give it to the Soviets. We're already infiltrating conferences. We got people all throughout the country. Those institutes I talked about were in the Congo. There's a other bunch of other fronts. Like there's so much, like you really, this is one of those episodes. I'm like, y'all really going to have to read the book. We don't have enough time to talk about all the shit that was in that book. Like, we're not even really getting into the the book also talks a lot about Nkrumah. We don't even get to get into a lot of that. Just a lot of information. So we come back to independence. In the, um, in the description below or whatever if we can. Yeah, it'll, be, it'll definitely be in the show notes, White Malice. Um, so <clears throat> the date of January 4th, 1959. So this is just a month after the conference. Just to give people a timeline of where we're at here. Because the conference is in December of 1958 that year. We're now in the very early parts of January. So really not even a month, probably a few weeks. There is a there's supposed to be a a rally for independence in the Congo and a, um, quote, fierce and bloody confrontation ensued lasting for four days. At least 500 people were killed. Many families buried their dead in the middle of the night. They were killed by the the um belgium administrate colonial administration police is who killed them so this launches you know even more protests um to the point where the belgians were debating whether or not they could even control the situation so they say 
we're going to give more, they promise increased local and district self-government and we'll eventually give you independence. Like that was their response because they saw like people could not be contained anymore. Now, of course, none of this happened. Then they, you know, brought more military in. Then, Lam- okay, Lam- we need to control y'all. then Lamuma gets arrested. And there's there's cables where they stay blatantly like, we need to get rid of Lamuma. Like, we're tired of this man. They arrest Lamuma. More riots happen. Lamuma's getting beat up in prison. Like, Lamuma has scars in his back. Um, so they have a round table um, in, in um, Brussels up in Belgium because... They're like, what are we going to do? We probably wanted to get these people independence. Um, there, but the people at the round table, again, they're recognized by different governments or not different governments, different parties. Cause again, this is something else we didn't get into. Like there's a lot of parties for independence in the Congo. There's not like one. So the Lumumba's party was a pop most popular party, but it wasn't like the, the dominant only party. Like there was, this, because there was a lot of the, we talk about the ethnic stuff. There was a lot of parties who just wanted to represent their ethnic group. And the thing that was unique about Lumumba's party was it was this unification of all Congolese. It wasn't like I'm leaning towards one group. Um, but despite that, there were a lot of them represented at this roundtable discussion in Brussels. But one of the demands of everyone at the table was let Lumumba out of prison. So, so it was like, we, we're not talking about a damn thing. Nah. Till homie, till homie get out. So they let him out. Right of- today. Yeah. So they let him out. He has he gets out of prison. He ain't got no clothes. They give him a suit. They they fly him from the Congo right to the table, goes up there and negotiates independence right after leaving prison, which is just wild. <laughs> you know, after being beaten down and scarred and all of this, negotiate and starts negotiating independence with the with the another uh, brand, but with with the Belgians like right after leaving prison. You know, like just imagine that. So they were, there's some stuff here that we can't get into. They were getting screwed over as far as like the Belgians were trying to negotiate like economic deals. And um, because again, they didn't educate any of their people. Their people didn't really have the skills. Some of the, the Congolese didn't always have the skills to even negotiate like what was going on. So we're back to the case of bad deals again because the, Cong- because the Belgians wanted to make sure if we're going to let y'all have independence, it still needs to be in our interest. You know, y'all don't get to call the shots. This is what we get. Neo- Let y'all have independence. Yeah. This is neocolonialism, right? Like, that's all we're talking about. This is the phase of neocolonialism, like, starting to enter into the picture. So, ultimately, they have mm-hmm. their, um, there is there is an election. Um, there's an 82% turnout. Um, the MNC, Lumumba's party, emerged the strongest party, gaining 33 of the 137 seats in the Chamber of Deputies. So like I said, there's a bunch of parties. So they were the majority party. They only got 33 out of 137 seats. You know, so that should just let you know how many parties there were. Um, there was other coalitions of parties who won other seats. Like we talked about whether it was um, there was a PNP party. That was a party that the Belgians liked. That was a party they felt was going to be more appropriate to the interest. But it was also understood we can't really get rid of Lumumba because he's just so popular. Like you know, we can't totally just oust him at this moment. Um, but they still tried, right? So the Belgians supported the PNP, PNP party to form government despite not having the majority. So even though that party didn't have the most of the seats, they told that party to form the government. Because basically to form a government is to say, there's, since there's not a majority party, you have to form a government amongst multiple parties. Um, you know, because this is more like how parliament works. This In the United States, we don't really know it like that. But like, so Mumuma's like, in accordance with the principles in the MNC, the party which won more votes than any other party in elections, that should form the government. The king of the Belgians should call upon the MNC to form the government, not these other folks, because we're the most popular party. Um, so this all like leads up to the day of in the day of the independent speech, June 30th, 1960. Um well, and pop this shit off. <laughs> so so like they're there to get independence, you know, and 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 the king is the, of of the Belgian king um, Badoyan. I don't even know how to say that dude's name. I don't care if I mess this one up. Um, so he says some things like in his speech. This is what he says while he's supposed to be giving away, right. and even that way of saying it, giving away independence. But yeah, while they're supposed to be recognizing independence, um, he says for eight years he says. 
Um, Belgian had sent to the Congo the best of its sons. These pioneers, he added, had built communications, founded a medical service, modernized agriculture, and built cities and ind industries and schools, raising the well-being of your populations and equipping the country with technicians indispensable to its development. This was an extraordinary claim, um, she says in the book. Um, uh, someone today observed the, the correspondent of the New York Times who was at the event. He said, barely half the Congolese can read and write. Only 16 Congolese are university or college graduates. 16. This is a country with millions of people. That's why I was saying earlier when they were trying to negotiate deals, they didn't really have the skills to negotiate the economics because, like, this is how undereducated. Like, this one's this is one of the worst colonies in, in Africa because even That's other colonies good. did better than it. That's um, funny. You said only 16, but you didn't go to those 16 to negotiate your treaties? I mean... But there uh, was something I read in the book. They said a lot of those people found themselves negotiating with their own teachers. So even in that case, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, yeah. So they said there were no Congolese doctors, lawyers, engineers, and no African officers in the 25,000-man Congolese army. Officers as in, like, like there were no, like, um, upper-level, like, soldiers. Like, only everybody was just rank and file. The black folks just rank and file. And the white folks ran the the they were the officers they were the top ranks so then um the king concluded his speech in a deeply paternalistic tone he says quote it is now up to you gentlemen he said the congolese in front of him to show that you are worthy of our confidence mark une heure décisive dans les destinées non seulement du congo lui-même mais je n'hésite pas à l'affirmer de l'afrique tout entière so Lumumba's there. Lumumba's there, like, you know, as this is happening. Like, he's listening. Like, he's actually physically there. Uh, so we're going to imagine. I could imagine him. You like, just know listening. he was doing the Birdman hair up. He was like, like I don't know who the he is. I don't know what the fuck he thought that was about to be. You know what? Even if that caught him off be... guard. I doubt yeah. it caught him off guard. But what sends me, though, is He's not even on the list of speakers. And he was like, what you're not about to do is hold my people in front of us. Yeah. I'm about to get up here. I got things. To, I, I need to get something off my chest. Bro, the way the way I imagine it happened <laughs> was he had this speech where like, all right, let me get this shit out the way because they, they about to say some bullshit, but let me be cool. And then they say the bullshit and he's like... <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> hey, hold on, bro. Let me fuck that shit. And, and there's a picture... What? There's a picture of him like he's like writing specifically. He's he's like he's like yo what like you can see there's a there's a out oh 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 for real oh for real you'll if you're watching and you'll see it but if you're listening there's like a wide shot you can see the king and you see Lamumba like writing like yeah. oh, I got that for that ass that nigga's like bars <laughs> he was like, oh, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fuck them up with this. <laughs> so friend of the show. Um, Rasul Mawad, you know, who's a big fan of, um, you know, I don't think fan, always. Don't, fan don't even really fit like big supporter and also just, um, you know, he's a bit, he's a lover of Patrice Lumumba and all, and that, that period. So I was just telling him about, you know, the episode. And I was like, yeah, we're going to read the speech. And he, and he, he, he offered to, um, share a recording of him reading the speech. So we're going to close. Um, you know, with speech today. Um, and then we're going to get into the, <clears throat> you know, what happens after this, what happens after independence. And that's a much sadder story. But since this is such a hard story, want to close on a positive note. And this is, a, this speech was great. So I uh, definitely so want to. Turn this up in your radio. <laughs> blast this in your stereo. <laughs> because Lamumba is about to set the shit off. <laughs> Talk to him, Rasul. Men and women of the Congo, victorious independence fighters, I salute you in the name of the Congolese government. I ask all of you, my friends, who tirelessly fought in our ranks to mark this June 30th, 1960, as an illustrious date that will ever be engraved in your hearts, a date whose meaning you will proudly explain to your children, so that they in turn might relate to their grandchildren and great-grandchildren the glorious history of our struggle for freedom. Although this independence of the Congo is being proclaimed today by agreement with Belgium, an amicable country with which we are on equal terms, 
no Congolese will ever forget that independence was won in struggle, a persevering and inspired struggle carried on from day to day, a struggle in which we were undaunted by privation or suffering and stinted neither strength nor blood. It was filled with tears, fire and blood. We are deeply proud of our struggle because it was just and noble and indispensable in putting an end to the humiliating bondage forced upon us. That was our lot for the 80 years of colonial rule. Our wounds are too fresh and much too painful to be forgotten. We've experienced forced labor in exchange for pay that did not allow us to satisfy our hunger, to clothe ourselves, to have decent lodgings, or to bring up our children as dearly loved ones. Morning, noon, and night, we were subjected to jeers, insults, and blows because we were Negroes. Who will ever forget that the Black was addressed as two, not because he was a friend, but because the polite vu was reserved for the white man. We have seen our lands seized in the name of ostensibly just laws, which gave recognition only to the right of might. We have not forgotten that the law was never the same for the white and the black, that it was lenient to the ones and cruel and human to the others. We've experienced the atrocious sufferings being persecuted for political convictions and religious beliefs and exiled from our land. Our lot was worse than death itself. We have not forgotten that the cities, the mansions were the whites and the tumble down huts for the blacks. That a black was not admitted to the cinemas, restaurants and shops set aside for Europeans. That a black traveled in the holds under the feet of the whites in their luxury cabins. Who will ever forget the shootings which killed so many of our brothers or the cells in which we were mercilessly thrown those who no longer wish to submit to the regime of injustice, oppression, and exploitation used by colonialists as a tool in their domination. All that, my brothers, brought us untold suffering. But we, who were elected by the votes of our representatives, representatives of the people, to guide our native land, we who have suffered in body and soul from colonial oppression, will tell you that henceforth, all that is finished with. The Republic of the Congo has been proclaimed and our beloved country's future is now in the hands of our people. Brothers, let us commence together a new struggle, a sublime struggle that will lead our country to peace, prosperity, and greatness. Together, we will establish social justice and ensure for every man a fair remuneration for his labor. We shall show the world what the black man can do when working in liberty. We shall make the Congo the pride of Africa. We shall see to it that the lands of our native country truly benefits its children. We will revise all the old laws and make them into new ones that will be just and noble. We will stop the persecution of free thought. We shall see to it that all citizens enjoy to the fullest extent the basic freedoms provided for by the Declaration of Human Rights. We shall eradicate all discrimination, wh whatever its origins. We shall ensure for everyone a station in life befitting his human dignity and worthy of his labor and his loyalty to the country. We shall institute in the country a peace, resting not on guns and bayonets, but on concord and goodwill. And in all this, my dear compatriots, we can rely not only on our enormous forces and immense wealth, but also on the assistance of numerous foreign states whose cooperation we shall accept when it is not aimed at imposing upon us an alien policy, but is given in the spirit of friendship. Even Belgium, which has finally learned the lesson of history and need no longer try to oppose our independence, is prepared to give us its aid and friendship for that end, an agreement has just been signed between our two equal and independent countries. I am sure that this cooperation will benefit both countries. For our part, we shall remain vigilant, try to observe the engagements we have freely made. Thus, both in the internal and external spheres, the new Congo being, being created by my government will be rich, free, and prosperous. But to attain our goal without delay, I ask all of you, 
legislators, and citizens of the Congo to give us all the help you can. I ask you all to sink your tribal quarrels. They weaken us and may cause us to be despised abroad. I ask you not to shrink from any sacrifice for the sake of ensuring the success of our grand undertaking. Finally, I ask you unconditionally to respect the life and property of fellow citizens and foreigners. We have settled in our country. If the conduct of these foreigners leaves much to be desired, our justice will promptly expel them from the territory of the Republic. If on the contrary, their conduct is good, they must be left in peace, for they too are working for our country's prosperity. The Congo's independence is a decisive step towards the liberation of the whole African continent. Our government, a government of national and popular unity will serve its country. I call on all Congolese citizens, men, women, and children to set themselves resolutely to the task of creating a national economy, ensuring our economic independence. Hommage aux combattants de la liberté nationale. Vive l'indépendance et l'unité africaine. Vive le Congo indépendant et souverain. Plane in a whole nother state. I'm trying to eat down a whole nother plate. Seem like my homies were stuck in the hood. I just